Hello there and good morning and welcome uh, to uh, our entire audience joining from around the world for another episode of our uh, in our webinar series, uh, a series that essentially looks to answer how COVID-19 will, will change the world. And we bring you perspectives from, from different experts and members of our community uh, as a whole here at Global Wonx. Um, we're excited for another fabulous uh, speaker who will be joining us today, Margaret O'Mara, who's Professor of History at the University of Washington and a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. Um, before I introduce Margaret, uh, I do want to say that uh, please uh, use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask questions throughout uh, the, the episode. Um, we uh, like to gain as many questions as possible and um, keep, a, keep a healthy time available at the end uh, so that we can cover as much ground as possible. Uh, just to remind those of you who are joining us for the first time global wants is a technology platform that connects businesses to global knowledge experts around the world uh, to date uh, we have built an expert network of 10,000 knowledge workers around the world in over 180 countries and we service uh, more than 100 clients around the world from fortune 50 companies to universities uh, and companies in the financial services industry um, we're delighted for you all to join us today. And if you'd like to learn more about Global Wonks, uh, please message matt.putnam at globalwonks.com to learn more about our products and services. So I'm delighted to be joined uh, today uh, by Margaret O'Mara, who's the Howard and Francis Keller Endowed Professor of History uh, at the University of Washington uh, and a contributing writer at the New York Times. Uh, Margaret uh, comes with a uh, wonderful uh, uh, career uh, spanning both uh, government service, academia, um, and uh, being a, uh, a known entity and voice when it comes to the intersections between the history of US politics, uh, high tech economy, um, and the technology sector from uh, an industry perspective. Uh, she has uh, written multiple uh, monographs uh, and articles on these subjects, uh, most recently, uh, the Code, Silicon Valley and the Remaking uh, of America. Uh, she's the co-author with David Kennedy and Elizabeth Cohen of a forthcoming editions uh, of widely used US history college textbook, The American Pageant, um, uh, which many of you uh, will be familiar with. And beyond the New York Times, her pieces have met, appeared in the Washington Post, the LA Times, Bloomberg, Foreign Policy, among others. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Margaret join us here today because the topic that she's going to be covering is uh, particularly salient uh, for our series. And that is thinking about how the tech sector and big tech specifically is going to be impacted by COVID, not necessarily only in terms of the industry itself, but the ripple effects globally in terms of how, both in terms of talent and work, but also uh, in terms of the dispersal of um, uh, the intellectual capital that we've become so familiar with and associated with Silicon Valley, how that may sprout up in other parts of the world. Um, thank you, Margaret, for joining us. Um, of course, uh, as those familiar with our uh, webinar series now know, uh, we'll open up the floor to you to, to provide us with further insights on this topic. Uh, you and I will then have a, a Q&A and uh, we'll then open it up to our audience. So, so please do uh, keep your questions coming throughout the webinar. Uh, Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bilal. Thank you to all of you. And thanks to everyone watching this worldwide and various time zones. Um, it's really such a pleasure to be here. And, I, um, and I'm, it's such a pleasure to talk to you about my work and about what I've learned at this really critical time in business and in so many other things. Um, so I, I'm a, um, I come to the story, uh, I come to this work on the history of the technology industry and particularly of Silicon Valley and other American tech clusters. Um, I came to it after, um, as Bilal mentioned, I, I started my career uh, as a lot of young people do working in Washington DC as a um, staff person um, I was working in the Clinton administration, and among things, I was um, it, it's, it, for part of that, I was working with Vice President Al Gore. Um, funnily enough, I, I tell Al Gore was known 
or among the things in his policy portfolio, and one thing that he has been a passion throughout his life has been technology. And he was one of the very first American politicians to really champion Silicon Valley and to kind of get it uh, in terms of the significance of these hardware and software platforms to American business and to politics and to communication. Um, uh, funnily enough, when I was working for Al Gore, I did not work on uh, technology issues. Uh, and when I was researching my last book, The Code, uh, I had the very strange experience of working in the archives of the Clinton administration and realizing that the um, meetings that I was reading about and the, um, the documents I was looking at were um, were quite actually happening down the hall from where I was, <laughs> um, completely absorbed in my own uh, own world and not realizing the immense significance of what was being built. And I think that's something that's useful to remember that so many things that are governing the um, the, the internet industry today, which is, remains American dominated, um, is uh, the product from a policy perspective. Um, it's the rules of the road were in the United States drawn up in the 1990s at a time when, as we know, the internet was very different. So one of the reasons that I wrote my most recent book, which is a history of Silicon Valley from the 1940s to the present, was really to help us understand how we got to now. Why did an agricultural valley in California become the capital of the high-tech world? This was not foreordained. This was not the result of government planning necessarily, although, as I will talk about and I talk extensively about in my book, government did have quite a bit to do with it. Um, but, but also, how do we understand now that the world is governed by, is eaten by software, as to paraphrase Mark Andreessen, how, how, and so many people who are not necessarily technologists um, are, are users of software, and also every company around the world is to some degree now a technology company because that piece of your business is extraordinarily important. How did we get to where these, um, you know, what is the evolution not only of these companies, the very large ones, as well as the medium and small one, and the business culture of the particularly of Silicon Valley or more broadly of the West Coast of the United States, including Seattle, where I'm talking to you from right now. Why did that, how did that come to be? Why have, you know, what, how, why is this history relevant? And so I, I do think, I, I'm in the history business, but I came into the history business after being in the policy business because I realized how important, how critical it was and how often lost it was to the, the historical antecedents of what policymakers are working on. And I think also what businesses work on on the day to day, it's very hard to, you don't have time to be reflective. You don't have time to sit back and say, well, let me think about where we were 20 years from now, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And so what I try to do in my work is show to a wider audience of policymakers and business leaders why this history is not only valuable and useful and fun to know, but actually can be really instrumental and predictive. It has predictive value, understanding, we're all thinking strategically, thinking forward about how to build the future. And I think particularly for the technology industry, which is so focused on moving forward, looking ahead, there has not been a lot of reflection or knowledge of its own past, and much less realizing that that past actually has bearings on your business. I think this is really important in this COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 moment, um, where as, as well as a moment in which technology platforms have become the mediator for, for politics, for culture, for all sorts of conversation, communication, and transactions. That this is understanding you know, that the future is very uncertain. And so how can we draw how can we learn from how we got to here to understand where we go to from there? So one of the things that I've explored in my work, I've written three books, two of which were focused on the history of the technology industry, and I've written quite extensively in sort of short form for the New York Times and elsewhere about this, is why is Silicon, how did Silicon Valley come to be? What's its secret? This is the question that has been posed to me by people from around the world again and again in the last 20 years since I started working on this stuff. And, um, and my answer is both, I, I have an answer I think that is um, 
both, I think it has a lot, a lot to learn from. It's also not quite as neat and tidy as we would like it to be, right? We would love to have a simple magic formula where, you know, you just plug and play and you can take your region and you can build a silicon something of your own. And as we've seen around the world, there have been multiple efforts over time. And in fact, for, for longer than you think, one of the stories I write about in my most recent book is when Charles de Gaulle came to Palo Alto in 1960 because he wanted to see its innovative magic and he toured Stanford and he went to Hewlett Packard and his whole motorcade drove around suburban Palo Alto, which if any of you've been to Palo Alto, you'll know it's still kind of a, you know, it's American suburbia. It was a lot sleepier then. So the fact that you had um, General de Gaulle <laughs> parading through the, the shopping centers and the subdivisions in his motorcade is this very kind of incongruous idea, but it underscores the, the fact that the world has been looking at Silicon Valley for a really long time as an innovative model. And we have seen lots of other tech clusters grow around the world, but yet we have not seen the valley, it's a, a, a sort of another valley. The valley has not been dislodged from its throne. Um, and so I think there's a lot to learn from that. Silicon Valley was not, um, you know, of course, nothing about history is inevitable. And the things that turned Silicon Valley from a place that was, again, an agricultural valley that 100 years ago was best known for its prune crop um, or production of fruit, but it's sort of fruit and fruit processing was its main business. Uh, what really was the turning point was the Second World War and the, and the American side of the Cold War after that. Um, what happens during that, the 1940s and after, is that, first of all, the population of California and the economic base of California in the West becomes much greater. There's a big demographic transition and in internal migration in the United States that grows the population of the West and the, and the Sun Belt, so the West, Southwest, and South of the United States. But a big catalyst for that is military spending, the famous military industrial complex um, out as, as des described, which was given its name by Dwight Eisenhower himself. The US government had not had a significant standing army before the 1940s, and much less had it been investing in or spending money on R&D, technology and science. And during the war and after the war, it gets into that in a very big way. And it does it in a very particular way, a particularly American way, which I think is really important for other geographies to, to take into account. Um, you may have heard that Americans don't like, or at least they say a lot, they don't like big government. They don't like government intervention. We're all about free enterprise and independence. Not surprising for a country that was founded on the overthrow of a monarch and, and, and landed aristocracy. But um, the reality is, is that we have had a very big government throughout most of American history, a big federal government. We just often have hidden it in clever ways through spending, um, decentralizing that spending either by, through contracts to private company, kind of privatized spending. And you see this during the Gold War with contracts to aerospace companies like Boeing or Lockheed, now Lockheed Martin, these sort of big these big companies that have both a commercial business, but also particularly during the 50s and 60s, a very, very large federal and defense business. The US government in the case of science and tech money also has spent heavily through universities, both public and private. And that has been a really critical ingredient to the US tech success, that it has had this higher education system that was heavily invested in at the public level, both the, the national government and the state level government, provincial governments, for quite a long time, that created what I call this escalator of mobility for people to come and get a very affordable, very, very, you know, a world-class education in fields including engineering and mathematics and computer science. And so that, and, and, and also, critically, the US also, increase the power of its higher education sector with immigration policies that made it easy for foreigners to come and study in the United States, to teach in the United States, and in many cases after they studied the United States, to stay in the United States, and in the case of tech companies, to, to, to a disproportionate degree, start tech companies. So there's a whole host of things that happen in the 1950s, 1960s, um, that kind of set this entrepreneurial flywheel in motion and do it in a way that isn't, 
top-down government planning, um, Dwight Eisenhower never said, I shall build a research park or a science city in Palo Alto. It just kind of grew that way. Um, but it flooded the system with money and, and created the foundation for a commercial market to grow and an entrepreneurial market to grow. So the secret of Silicon Valley isn't just big government and it also isn't just freewheeling entrepreneurship. It's this combination of both. And that's something that's particularly hard for Americans to accept that you kind of have this symbiotic relationship between the two. But that absolutely is critical to understanding why Silicon Valley has been this incredible generator of one generation of companies after another. The other thing that is really important to Silicon Valley success, which I think is instructive in thinking about where are we going now, has been the actual physical geography and the clustering itself. That it is a, a very, one of the things that set this tech, tech cluster apart very early was one you had starting from the 1960s forward, you had people starting their own companies, which was a strange thing to do in mid 20th century America. One of the, um, one of the senior venture capitalists I interviewed for my book, who's been working in the Valley since the 1950s said, you have to understand back then in the beginning, if you were starting your own company, it meant you were strange and you couldn't work for anybody. That was not normal. But then you start having these examples of super successful startups, Fairchild Semiconductor, first starting with the microchip companies like Fairchild National, and then that gives way to Intel, which is founded in 1968. And then by the late 70s and early 80s, you have personal computer companies, and then the 90s, internet companies. And in the 21st century, you have the giants we have today. So this sort of successive generations of startups and this very geographically um, cl tightly clustered network, not just of tech companies and engineers. This is a really critical piece. It's not just the tech people or the technical people that are the secret to Silicon Valley. It's also that the Valley very early on developed specialized service industries, law firms, marketing firms, real estate development firms that are all geared around this very particular small electronics industry that's growing there and serving the needs, distinctive needs of this kind of odd set of companies that are unlike, that are doing, producing products that for a long time don't have a commercial market. And then when they do have a commercial market, it's all enterprise. There's no, the first consumer facing businesses are in the seventies with video games and personal computers. That's the first time that Silicon Valley kind of pops into the popular consciousness as a place and a thing. So having this cluster that's not just tech companies, but this, this, larger, this larger cluster. So thinking, of, let's, thinking forward about, first of all, the state, of the state of the industry globally before COVID and now what COVID means. Before COVID, it's funny, I had been, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I had spent, uh, I had been a bit negative on, um, uh, before, this, before this podcast, I shared with Bilal some of the things I'd written and in, um, in 2010, I wrote a piece for foreign policy um, that was a pretty, pretty much a downer of a piece that was about, hey, places around the world, you really can't replicate Silicon Valley's magic. Um, I joke that I probably gave up, you know, many, many, many lucrative consulting contracts because I was telling people what couldn't be done rather than what could be done. But I'll tell you, now, you know, now in sort of by, by, by 2020, I have a very, very different take on it because I think that the geography of tech is very different. You see a lot of places around the world, either led by public sector or private sector, or more importantly, a combination of both, and also being led by the people who are, you know, from a certain place. And they're like, I want to see a start. I want to continue to live and work in the place that I'm from. I don't want to have to move to California to build a company. Now you're seeing really viable startup clusters rather than just let's build a research park and hope people come, which was not the strategy of everyone, but it was a pretty, a, an all too frequent strategy. It kind of stopped, economic development stopped at the buildings, didn't think about the kind of organic community you needed to create to create a community of entrepreneurial enterprise and innovation. But now I, I am, you know, you have a, uh, across the, um, 
across the globe, you have st real startup clusters that are building on core competencies already in the ecosystem that are that are the product in part of incentives, very targeted incentives by governments, either national or provincial or local, to nurture talent, keep it there, give people incentives to start companies and help them along as they're getting off the ground. And also places investment in place. One of the key ingredients of Silicon Valley's magic is the place itself. I don't want to overstate the weather in Palo Alto, although having been a resident of Seattle for the last 16 years, I can say that it kind of does help when it's sunny. <laughs> um, although Seattle has had, you know, has has weather like London and it's um, it still had a, has a very vibrant tech economy, but we also have hiking and mountains and fabulous things. So, um, but that quality of place that you're, you know, people want to are choosing these very educated workers who have a lot of are fortunate enough to have a choice about where they live are often now, you know, when they see they're realizing, oh, I can work for either a big American tech company that has an office in the country or city in which I'm from or want to live, or the, this, you know, this, this city or country where I'm from or want to live now has the capacity, educational, um, entrepreneurial, governmental, all those things. We're starting to, you know, we, we're, we're getting, creating this sandbox for innovation that wasn't there before. So I'm really heartened by the real variety and the recognition that different geographies have realized, oh, you can't just build a research park and hope everyone shows up. It isn't just about buildings. It isn't just about institutions that actually part of the secret of Silicon Valley too is time and having multi-generational networks of entrepreneurial enterprise that are connecting to one another. Whether you have one large company that then has its employees create spin-off companies from that. We've seen a lot of that in Seattle with Microsoft and now with Amazon. We're a big company town, but we have a lot of startups spinning, spinning off from those big companies. Or if you have a kind of more organic cluster growing that again is related to the things that a region has been good at doing for a long time. So what does this mean in this moment of, of global reset, economic reset, and also with new um, new dynamics, public health dynamics that are shaping things. First of all, the work from home thing, blowing my mind. For American tech companies, particularly the large ones who have invested heavily in physical campuses and also kind of integrated that into their culture, kind of insisted that people not work from home, saying working from home is not our, that's not part of our culture, you gotta show up. And so the fact that companies like Twitter and Facebook are not just saying we're working for a home for the duration of this, however long this goes on, but saying, I think we're gonna do this forever. And then creating opportunities for people to live in smaller cities or towns or live in other geographies and still work for these companies. Um, it's gonna allow them to, these companies to pay people less because they're not gonna be living in the Bay Area or very high priced metros around the world. So that's, you know, there's a bottom line attraction. I also, when I look at these, what these big tech companies do, I think I see from history, it has a ripple effect on what other companies do. What other large companies do, you know, once Google got the ping pong tables and the free food, everyone's like, oh, we need that ping pong tables and free food. Um, so uh, that, that, that has ripple effects on other sectors, other white collar sectors in their recruitment and retention of high value personnel. But it also has a effect, you know, further down the chain for small and medium sized enterprises. Um, and I think in tech, this tech sector, certainly where you have both either startups or, or small enterprises that are still kind of coming out of, you know, they're still venture funded or they're still, you know, their margins are not as, you know, robust as, as some of the big guys. They don't have a lot of cash on hand like Google or Microsoft. They're going to look at their overhead for their office space and say, why do we have this? And so we already have a lot of examples of tech companies with global teams with a lot of people working remotely, I think we're gonna see a real push, you know, more and more of that because, not just because of COVID, um, but also because this in, intense experiment of working at scale has, um, has worked. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to, I'm gonna uh, bring Bilal in and, and stop talking at you and then start talking with you. So thanks for having me.